Great. Good afternoon and welcome to the first um, session of Sonaki's Digital Classics uh, Spring 2021. Um, this is the Digital Culture Heritage semester um, that, uh, that we're just starting off now. Uh, this semester is, um, is co-convened by myself, um, by Alicia Walsh, who you can see to my right, um, and also by Andrea Wallace and Valeria Vitale, who are um, who are not with us this week, but will will appear in the next time in the next couple of weeks. Um, today's session is the first session of this semester, and the session is on three D imaging and scanning, and um, will be primarily taught after a, a very brief and insignificant introduction from me um, by Alicia and Kelly McClinton, who um, is also joining us here on the screen. Um, before we start that, I want to just sort of very quickly introduce the semester as a whole for, for those of you who, who will be coming back and watching um, the, rest, the rest of this. Um, so um, I have the program uh, here. Um, and uh, let me... Um, sorry, zoom, zoom that in a bit. Um, yeah. Um, so, um, so this 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 the program has um, several several sessions on um, aspects of three uh, D imaging and um, uh, and and modeling. Um, so this session, um, also the session in week um, seven and week nine. Um, which will talk about different aspects of, um, of 3D, and I'll talk more about those um, in a moment. Um, we have several sessions which impact on some aspect of, um, of mapping and ge ge geographical technologies and spatial technologies, um, in particular the, the week two next week um, on community mapping, um, a, section, a session on a linked geographical data in week four, and a session on geographical information systems, which is a kind of geographical database um, in week six. And there's also a thread through um, through several of these sessions and some of the other sessions on aspects of legal and ethical issues around cultural heritage, intellectual property, um, uh, ownership of, of of heritage, and um, and how does that is that ownership impacted by our digitization of or digital treatment of um, of that sort of heritage? So there's, there's those are the, the, the threads um, running through the the semester. Um, for the um, for the three sessions on on 3D, um, we we want to talk a little bit about um, for this session we're focusing on um, on 3D imaging, but I want to um, talk um, a bit. So here I'll just throw up the slides um, for this um, session. Um, um, the um, so I'll, t I'll talk um, a little bit about the, the different 3D methods that um, that we um, uh, that we talk about when we talk about 3D technology. Um, in particular, the the terms 3D imaging and 3D uh, modeling, which are sometimes used interchangeably, but which I think there's a, there's a, there's an important distinction um, between. Um, and then in the um, the second part of this session, Alicia will give a case study on. Um, uh, 3D scanning of various museum objects. Um, for the third part, we'll have another case study from Kelly on um, uh, 3D imaging of Roman houses, and she'll talk a bit about that. And then finally, Alicia and Kelly will give a photogrammetry tutorial, both on the um, the photography aspect of it and on the um, on the software um, to produce a model from that. Um, so. Um, when we talk about 3D methods, um, there, there are several, um, several kinds of, uh, of activities and technologies that can be used when we talk about it. This, this week we're talking about 3D imaging, um, sometimes also called scanning, um, although possibly not all imaging is scanning, but, but we'll, we'll come to that. Um, there are also, uh, so the main distinction between 3D imaging and 3D modeling is that you image something um, that exists that you have in front of you. Um, you model something 
um, possibly because it either doesn't exist anymore or it doesn't exist yet, or you're trying to reconstruct it in some way. So it's sometimes called 3D visualization. So um, 3D modeling is what architects do using, using CAD software, for example, computer-aided design software, um, to design a building that doesn't yet exist. Um, and archaeologists use 3D modeling to try and try and recreate an ancient building that may not entirely exist anymore or may not exist at all anymore. Um, so that's the, the main distinction between those um, those technologies. Um, there's there's also a few other terms that you'll um, you'll come across. Um, virtual reality is the um, the concept of taking a three D model and putting it in an environment such that. Um, the user can be immersed in that environment, either in a computer game-like interface or perhaps even more immersively with uh, a th sort of 3D goggles, um, which allow you to have, um, you know, uh, uh, completely, you know, be immersed. So when you turn your head to the left, um, you pan around and you see... Um, you see the uh, the landscape um, to the left um, of where you would be as well, and that that can be quite useful for for walking through ancient landscapes and so forth, as well as for as well as for the fun of of gaming. Um, augmented reality is is a slightly different um, uh, experience that that involves um, enhancing. Um, more sort of photographic um, or video of um, real space or current space with the 3D model superimposed um, over that in some in some way, and that can be done either in real time or um, or not. Um, and in in um, uh, I it occurs to me I had slides for each of these. Um, so um, for for augmented reality, you for example you can stand in the landscape, look at it on your tablet or mobile device. Um, and the augmented reality software will um, will superimpose um, a historical um, uh, building or landscape over the the video that you're seeing of the real landscape there. And as I say, that can either be done in real time or it can be done with um, with copies of the um, of the material. Um, and uh, finally, just wanted to mention very briefly the concept of three D printing. We'll be talking about that in a little bit more detail in a few weeks' time. Um, but this is this is the concept of of taking a three a digital three D model and turning it again into something material, something something tangible um, that um, that we have um, that we can hold in our hands. And there's there's various um, reasons for that, and that's one of the key ways in which we can publish um, or, or redistribute three D models that we've um, that we've made um, either through imaging or, or, or modeling in in some way. Um, so uh, the last the last part of my um, sort of um, very uh, very quick introduction here is talking about various different kinds of uh, 3D um, imaging technologies specifically, um, and I'm going to talk I'm going to talk about uh, a handful of these technologies, not in any detail because um, the, the the main important ones will be covered. Uh, in more detail by the uh, by the, the presentations and case studies that Alicia and Kelly are going to give us, but just to give a very brief sort of overview from this, um, really there are there are um, three main kinds of uh, 3D imaging technologies, and those um, those are uh, surface geometry imaging, which uh, which laser scanning um, and its um, its siblings are the main um, example, um, volumetric. Um, technologies, um, so X-raying and you know doing CT scans of um, of an object and creating a full 3D um, model of its of its entire volume, not just of its surface. And then there's various um, reconstructed 3D models based on um, photographic evidence. So you have multiple photographs um, constructed to make um, single um, uh, three 3D model um, based um, based on that. And photogrammetry and RTI are the two. Um, main examples that um, that we often get talked about with cultural heritage for for those um, technologies. So um, the the first um, uh, thing to to highlight is the main difference in formats of um, 3D 3D models. When you have a 3D model, what what are we actually talking about in terms of the data format und underneath the file? Um, we we have a sense of what a 3D photograph is. It's it's a grid. Of pixels of different colors, um, you you know, often in very very high resolution. So, what what is a three D um, uh, format? And there are two main formats. Um, there's the um, the point cloud, which which is the most raw data format, if you like. Um, this is similar in some ways to um, to the to the 
um, the grid of pixels for, from a 2D image um, in that it's, you know, it's a, it's a volume um, made of pixels. The pixels are gen generally will tend to be, or, or voxels, whatever you, you'd, you'd call them, would tend to be the, um, the points on the surface of the object um, unless it's, unless it's a, a volumetric model. Um, but each point represents a point in space that um, that is, you know, that is part of the outside of this. And these points, um, therefore, can be um, uh, plotted on on a, a three dimensional um, uh, matrix. They they can they they have x, y, and z coordinates. Um, and this, you know, a three D model can have millions and millions and millions of points in order to be relatively to be high high resolution. So, which is why three D models are so so big in terms of file size very often. Um, but um, but a point cloud because these points um, are arbitrary points and a point geometrically speaking has no um, has no dimensions. Um, this isn't in, in in itself a 3D model. This is this is a set of points in space which can be extract interpreted on in various ways to make to be to be used as a 3D model. You have to think in terms of um, various uh, mathematical formulae to turn it into a, a um, an impermeable surface. Um, so one way, one of the ways in which um, uh, 3D models are represented that that has an actual surface rather than just these um, these points is is a 3D mesh. And what a mesh is 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 again it's a series of points, but those points are all linked with one another to make a series of triangles. So we, what we actually have is a series of triangles making the surface. This then is a solid surface. It has no gaps in it. You don't have to do any interpretation or extrapolation to turn it into something that you can, for example, 3D print, or that you can, for example, merge with another 3D object. Or attach in some way. So those are those are the, the two main um, imaging outputs um, that we talk about. Um, and and in some of the um, the presentations, you'll say, well, from this we created a point cloud, and then we had to turn it into a mesh. That's that's what they're talking about. These these sorts of um, uh, these these are the two um, formats that we're talking about. Um, so just um, very quickly, um, the, the, I put these slides in here more for you to look at the slides than for me to talk about them. Um, but the, the main um, types of, of scanning, so there's um, the time of flight um, laser scanning. This works exactly like um, uh, you know, sonar or something similar to that. Um, works, um, you, you shine a laser at an object and by measuring how long it takes to come back to you, you know how far away it was because you know what the speed of light is. Okay, and if you shine millions and millions and millions of lasers um, at slightly different angles, then you get back a very detailed 3D image of how far away the lasers got before they were reflected back to you. Um, so that's that's the that's the concept of um, time of flight. Um, another model um, for laser scanning is triangulation where you have two lasers um, sent and by both being reflected back at slightly different angles, you know exactly where in space relative to the two um, emitters and the two receptors um, the, um, the, uh, the, the 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 point it's bouncing back from is um, and uh, similarly uh, the third the third model is structured light, which I think Alicia might explain a little bit better than um, than I will but the, the idea here is that you you shine several lights um, uh, beams of light, um, and stri stripes in um, in various ways, um, and looking at the way that in combination those lights are deformed by whatever they bump into and bounce off of, um, you get a sense of the the distance and the shape and the dimension of the of the object that you're shining the lights on. Um, all of these um, are are relatively um, expensive technology, um, la laser scanning. Some some much more than others. Um, uh, the so those are those are all surface um, surface geometry because all, all they can do is reflect off the surface of an object. The the volumetric um, technology that um, that I mentioned is things like CT scanning, um, which are medical technologies. Again, extremely expensive, um, not at all portable. You basically have to go to a lab which has a CT scanner in it in order to to um, image an object, but it's very useful for objects where it's not only the surface you're interested in. So for example, a mummy, as in the two the examples of these two photographs, a human mummy or a, or a crocodile mummy, you get, um, you get a, a, a view of what's inside without having to cut the object open. Um, then there's photogrammetry, which I won't, I won't really talk about at all because that's, um, that's something that um, there's going to be talked about a lot for the rest of this session. Um, and the, the idea basically is you take many, many photographs from, from, from different angles and software extrapolates the 3D geometry from those, um, those photographs. Um, structure from motion is almost, is almost exactly the same 
um, technology. Um, in some ways, it's it's even it's even cheaper. You basically you take you take a video, if you like, of 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 the object, and it's able to reconstruct the the thing. And, and because a video is multiple images, as as you as you know, that's it's it's largely the same sort of um, technology. Um, a slightly different technology is RTI, reflectance transformation imaging, um, which um, involves not taking photographs from different angles, but taking a photograph of a relatively um, flat surface from a single angle and changing the light source between each photograph. And that gives you, um, that gives you a sense of the, uh, the geometry of the surface, but it doesn't, it doesn't give you um, uh, a full 3D um, image of the, of the object. It just gives you a certain amount of thing, and that's very useful for um, for forensic purposes. It can help you read damaged text on a surface, so forth and so forth. But it doesn't um, it doesn't necessarily uh, give you a full three D model that you could print in in the um, in the full sense. Um, so um, that was the last of my um, slides. I think I'm handing over to Alicia. I should have said. Um, by the way, sorry, that I should have said at the beginning. Um, uh, firstly, apologies for starting a little bit late. There was the usual technical snafu that um, we um, we come to expect um, when using computers in any context whatsoever. Um, and secondly, that um, greetings to everyone watching us live. Please do use the live chat feature on the um, on the right hand side um, or below the video on YouTube, in um, depending on the view you're using, um, to to both say hi, but also to um, to ask questions, and in particular towards the end, we'll have a bit of uh, a bit of discussion. Um, uh, this um, this session is also available um, uh, on YouTube after the um, after the live session is over. So if you're watching this um, not live, welcome also. Please feel free to use this video in any um, uh, any context you like. We um, we um, have open licensed this this YouTube channel so that it can be used um, pedagogically. Please feel free to reshow this in a classroom or to to you know assign it to students um, as reading. Likewise for the session page, there's a link to that on the um, below the YouTube video. Um, so um, that that has readings and exercises and so forth. All of these things are meant to be used as open um, educational resources. So I, I use these in my class, but that's not the only reason we're, we're doing this. Other people use these for, for other reasons as well. So so that would be um, that would be great. Um, I uh, hope that um, if you're watching this live, you are able to turn on YouTube's automatic captioning feature. Um, I don't haven't tested that, unfortunately, so I don't know how well that works. Apologies if it's not um, working um, that well, but um, but I believe that the, um, the the YouTube's automatic captioning feature does turn on when you watch the archived version of this. Um, so um, so at any rate, hopefully that um, that will work. Um, but um, so I think that was all the things that I should have said at the beginning as a, as a preamble. Apologies for putting those out of out of sequence. Um, also, apologies for eating into um, into Alicia's time. Please um, go ahead, Alicia. All right. Thank you, Gabby. And yeah, thank you to, to everyone joining us today. Um, just to add to the technical difficulties, I will be showing my screen, but I can't do it in presenter mode. So. Uh, bear with me a little bit there. And okay, so before I start, I just want to give a quick disclaimer that um, I will be showing some images and 3D models of human skeletal remains. So my apologies if that causes you any discomfort. So today I'm going to discuss the differences between the between three main technologies used in 3D modeling or 3D imaging, sorry. Um, laser scanning, structured light scanning, and photogrammetry. And then I'm gonna talk about a project I was involved with through Leiden University, in which I created a digital reference collection of artifacts using these three methods. So I'll go into the workflow that I used to capture each of the objects, um, as well as some common problems that I ran into, which may be of interest to you in case you're just starting out in 3D imaging. So just briefly, because Gabby already mentioned um, time of flight and triangulation, but laser scanning can use either of these principles. Um, time of flight is usually used in aerial scanning, 
whereas triangulation is used for uh, smaller objects. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on from now on. Um, in 3D laser scanning, the laser dot or the line is projected onto the object, and then the sensor measures the distance to the surface of the object. So the scanner will determine the position of the object by using reference features on the surface while it's being scanned. And then these data points are collected and converted into a point cloud. In structured light scanning is another triangulation-based uh, 3D scanning method in which there are two cameras and a projection unit. And the sensor projects a known light pattern onto the object and the camera captures how the light pattern is becoming distorted as it moves along the surface. So the advantages of this method is its speed and its precision. However, they can be more expensive. Um, the scanner that I used in the project I'm gonna be discussing, that one costs almost 20,000 euros. So um, it can be out of reach to a lot of people. And then in photogrammetry, point clouds are constructed from digital photographs by capturing different but overlapping views of the object. And then these photos are imported in software and they undergo a workflow starting with the aligning of the photos to create a sparse cloud and finishing with applying the texture on top of the mesh. And we're gonna discuss this in more detail during the tutorial. So um, that's why I've kind of glossed over this. But um, this method can be used both close range and in aerial. Um, so close range photogrammetry uses a handheld camera such as a DSLR with a fixed focal length in order to capture smaller objects such as artifacts. Whereas aerial photogrammetry uses aerial images captured by satellite or aircraft or a drone um, to collect images of buildings and structures or a terrain. And photogrammetry is the most affordable method of 3D imaging. Um, as its cost is related to the type of camera you're using, and as well as your computer and the software that you choose. Um, and there are many softwares out there that are free open access. Um, the one that we're gonna be talking about today, Agisoft Magishape, that one, is, you need a license for that, um, but um, for the demo, there's a demo version and then there's a free trial version. So that's what we're gonna be talking about later. Okay, so moving on to the case study. Uh, the project um, that I'm gonna discuss, I was developed to research the possible applications and the potential of 3D models amongst students and instructors. So my role in this project was to develop methodologies for creating 3D models of various archeological materials, as well as comparing the results of models created through photogrammetry and 3D scanning. So I'm gonna discuss the visualization tools implemented, the challenges that arose, and the preliminary results we determined um, about how this will impact both the learning and the teaching processes. So the future of experience in the past was a pilot project coordinated by Drs. Rachel Schatz, Martina Ravello Lamy, and Maurice Ceresi at the Faculty of Archaeology at Leiden University. Under their supervision, I had three months to create a digital reference collection as a learning tool, which allows teachers and students to access and engage with archaeological reference collection stored at the faculty. Um, by means of different 3D visualization devices. Um, the techniques used in this project, again, were photogrammetry, 3D laser scanning, and structured light scanning, which created models of three types of material, uh, ceramic, bone, and lithic. In order to achieve these goals, different methodologies and workflows had to be developed based on the material in question, and based on what the instructor wished, wished to highlight in their teaching. So Agisoft Metashape was used to render the photogrammetry models for ceramics and for one bone. The next engine laser scanner was used for both ceramic and for bone artifacts. And for lithics, the Artec 3D Space Spider scanner was used, which was a structured light scanner. And the Artec was also used uh, during the last few weeks of the project on bone and ceramics in order to complete a comparative analysis of the results that could be achieved with each technology. Uh, this is the problem when you don't go on presenter mode. So the materials were chosen so that the project coordinators may use the digital artifacts in their classrooms when access to the physical material was too difficult. 
Um, so like when the ratio of students to material was unsuitable or if the material is too fragile to handle in the classroom. And the goal was for students to access them on their own devices and to be able to view them as study material um, at home uh, with the help of annotated models. And each instructor had individual aims for visualizing their artifacts. The 3D ceramic models uh, will be used to show varying manufacturing techniques used to create the object and how to relate different surface macro traces to relevant production methods. The bone artifacts, on the other hand, will be used to highlight various components of a bone or say bones that make up a skull um, or deformation due to disease, um, all when there's low access to the physical material in the classroom. And finally, the lithic artifacts benefited from 3D scanning so that an extensive reference collection could be built on many different types um, and to document their raw material and descriptions um, so that students, again, can study them in a more interactive way. So starting with ceramics, um, the goal was to teach students about surface traces on the ceramic vessel, as well as show varying production techniques. Um, as these surface traces are often difficult to detect, a high resolution mesh had to be created. Um, so while photogrammetry offers a more photorealistic textured model of the artifact, the mesh did not highlight areas of significance as well as the next engine laser scanner could. So for example, large vessels such as this pot, um, which was about 80 centimeters in diameter, was more efficiently captured using photogrammetry since the next engine would have required many more scans than photographs um, and would have created a much larger data set. However, the areas that the instructor wanted to highlight, um, such as the diagonal angulations um, in the inner rim, um, they're not very clear in the mesh view that was created through photogrammetry. And unfortunately, due to the quality of the computers available for this part of the project, the photogrammetry models had to be run on a low resolution mesh um, in the interest of time. Um, I started it on a high resolution and it was taking days to process. <laughs> so. Um, we had to make some sacrifices there. So the next engine was able to capture a higher resolution model in a shorter period of time. Therefore, it was the technology of choice to all objects that were suitable in size. This Byzantine oil lamp um, has a high resolution mesh, which shows striations and pinching. However, the texture is um, not fantastic, um, although it does suitably show traces of soot on the spout there. And creating a workflow for ceramics was the most challenging and time consuming out of the three object types, um, as each pot or shirt had a unique shape or surface. And their uniqueness determined if the next engine could be set up in a wide or a macro setting, and how many different positions the item had to be changed to in order to capture all its sides. So of the 285 models that were produced during this project, 32 of them were ceramic. Meanwhile, for the bone artifacts, 24 3D models were created. The next engine laser scanner was usually used um, with the exception of one complete pelvis, which was too large for the scanner. And that was uh, imaged using photogrammetry. The Artec 3D Space Spider was also used on one pelvis in order to compare results with the next engine. And the desire to create 3D models of these remains were due to the fact that they would serve as better reference material um, than the usual method, which are model casts. Currently, instructors in the osteology department purchase casts of bone, um, but they don't often reflect what the instructor is aiming at showing. And furthermore, the cost of one bone cast can reach hundreds or even thousands. So in this case, 3D models would have a cost benefit as this creation would be much less expensive than the purchase of a cast. So four types of bones were scanned, um, skulls, mandibles, sacrums, and pelvises. So one bone, this complete pelvis, was too large for the laser scanner to capture 
So Adjusoft Metashape was used to process um, the model, which yielded a high definition textured result. And since the instructor wasn't looking at surface traces, um, a low, re low to medium resolution um, mesh was sufficient. However, when you compare the mesh, mesh resolution to that of a pelvis scanned with the next engine laser scanner, the quality is far better when it is laser scanned. The bones were placed on, a next, on the next engine turntable for a 360 degree scan. And then the objects were repositioned twice and two bracket scans were completed. And where there were areas of particular interest, the scanner was moved to a macro setting, which enables a close up scan um, which it captures less of a surface area, but it does offer a greater resolution. And then a comparison between 3D scanning capabilities was done when I gained access to the Artex Spider. Um, and I scanned the same pelvis that had undergone the next engine laser scan. And this pelvis was of particular interest because of the pathology present on the hip joint and is often difficult to pick up with a scanner or by photogrammetry. And the Artex spider was able to capture this pathology to a higher degree than the next engine. However, with this particular pathology, which is osteoarthritis, um, it was also unable to be captured completely um, by using the Artex because of the shiny surface that the disease tends to leave on the bone. And finally, the lithic artifacts underwent 3D scanning through the use of the Artec Space Spider. Um, this handheld device is able to capture thin, sharp edges and produces the highest resolution seen amongst the three methods. The texture um, is still not as sharp as the photogrammetry results, um, but it was still greater than the laser scanner. And scanning and processing times for the scanner was also much lower than the other two, whereas photogrammetry and laser scanning often took hours or even days to process, the Artec scans were generally completed in about five to 10 minutes. So of the 285 models uh, produced, 229 of them were lithics. And a few lithics were also 3D scanned using the next engine laser scanner, um, but this was before I gained access to the Artec. Uh, one particular model created was of this flint core and flake. And this was to allow the instructor to demonstrate to their students how flakes were struck off of the core and to show its refitting. Um, so to do this, um, I scanned two separate models, the um, core and the flake and then exported them into Blender uh, to create an animation to show its refitting. The choice of how to display these models was discussed at length during the course of this project. Um, they are currently stored on Sketchfab through a pro account that allows private models and not to be downloadable currently. Sketchfab was chosen because it's user-friendly. Um, it allows the viewer to switch easily between textured and mesh views, and it allows the models to be annotated. And we also tested uh, embedding these Sketchfab models into Brightspace, the coursework platform, so that students may use their logins and view the models um, and their other course material all in one space. So we hope to make this digital archive public um, so that a greater audience can access it. Um, this, de de this decision is going to depend on ethical approval from the faculty as discussions need to be held over um, publishing uh, models of human remains online as well as releasing unpublished data. So a total of 285 3D models were created for this digital reference collection, 32 ceramic, 24 bones, and 229 lithics. The number variation is due to the material's need for constant change in setup and the processing times for the device used. In terms of point resolution, the best results were yielded through the Artex Spider, followed by the next engine, and finally through photogrammetry. However, the use of these technologies is not always realistic in projects such as these. Photogrammetry remains a popular option for 3D imaging as it is the most cost effective. Um, it produces photorealistic textured results. Um, however, when aiming to show 
macro surface traces on ceramic material, it's important to have a high resolution mesh, which was better created through laser scanning or structured light scanning. The next engine laser scanner is a suitable cost-effective tool for cultural institutions to use. However, it is an older device and um, the camera on it does not have a very high resolution. The Artec 3D Space Fighter created the highest resolution models and it was very user-friendly and had the fastest processing times. However, as I mentioned, it's very expensive. There were two main challenges that arose during this project, uh, time and the technology available. As it was a pilot project, we were given enough funding to complete three months of full-time work to create this collection, one month for each material type. However, it was a challenge dividing time um, to create enough models of varying examples so that it could be used as a reference collection. Um, and often there was little time to complete enough post-processing for each model that required it. Secondly, the technology we had on hand was not always suitable for this type of project. A computer powerful enough to render these models in a timely manner um, was mostly absent. During the third and final month, we were loaned the Artec 3D Space Fighter accompanied with a more powerful computer, and this greatly increased the processing times and the overall quality of the models. Um, having to deal with objects greatly different in nature, material, and dimension posed the biggest challenge in terms of determining the appropriate workflow, um, evaluating the equipment needed, and the time investment. So this large pot, for example, um, which I originally rendered using photogrammetry, I wanted to try the Artec spider on it to see if I could get a better resolution model. However, using the Artec on a vessel of this size came with its own challenges. Um, the Artec needs to keep a consistent distance from the object, and that was quite difficult to maintain while moving around the pod and looking at the computer screen. It also created an enormous amount of data. Um, I took 56 scans of this vessel, and which all then had to be aligned. The preliminary results of this pilot project uh, were assessed by holding a mock class where students were invited to a lecture where both the ceramic and the bone models were used by their respective instructors. Each short lecture uh, included an introduction to the material, um, and then the models were projected to visualize points of interest on the material. The students were then given uh, physical objects different from the 3D models, and they were asked to locate specific traits on the object with the help of the digital reference uh, viewed on their own devices. So general feedback from this exercise determined that the majority of students enjoyed um, having the digital artifacts as a reference, and they especially enjoyed the interactive nature of the lesson. Many also agreed that it would be a useful, it would be useful to be able to access these models at home as a reference guide, um, which would be far, mo far more helpful than photographs. The challenge that almost all of the students mentioned was that the models did not load quickly or they lagged. And this could be a result of the file sizes that were uploaded, and that can be fixed by decimating the models um, so that they can be viewed on standard computers and tablets. However, sometimes you can lose quality of a model when you decimate it. Um, another downside was that the use of 3D models in the classroom increased screen time, which many found to be a disadvantage, and the necessity of bringing a laptop or a tablet to class when they otherwise would not or they could not was also viewed as a downside. Of course, this evaluation was conducted before the pandemic, so um, I wonder if the feedback would be a little bit different now. And finally, one interesting comment mentioned was the ethical aspect of the project. Um, while ethical approval should be granted before publishing human remains online, one student noted that they thought it was more respectful to view human remains in 3D um, rather than handling the physical object in the classroom. So I just wanted to give a thank you to the project managers and everyone else involved with the project. And then I will pass it back to Kelly, I think. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. That's um, that's a really um, useful um, presentation. The um, I think what was particularly useful was the, the detailed um, technical discussion of the different um, the different approaches, which I think has given us you know some good some good um, grounding there, especially comparatively, um, and so forth. Um, and I think the um, 
that uh, Kelly's um, uh, case study was chosen to highlight particularly the, um, uh, the, the academic and research value of doing this sort of imaging. So, so that, that, that'll be, you know, make a very useful um, complementarity between the two, um, the two sessions. I also just wanted very briefly to mention that um, you, uh, you discussed Sketchfab there briefly and that we will be discussing Sketchfab in a bit more detail in about uh, six weeks time, I think. So um, it would be um, good to be able to come back to that. So um, apologies for the intervention. I hand over to Kelly. <laughs> Well, thank you for the fascinating presentation, Alicia um, and Gabby. It was really interesting to kind of hear from both of you. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen, I think. Yeah, okay. And then, um, yeah, I'm excited to, to kind of um, present my case study, and then hopefully this will provide, as um, Gabby mentioned, a contrast in some ways, but also there's some interesting similarities, um, Alicia, to what some of the issues that you talked about in your project. So maybe those will emerge um, as we go. So um, before we begin, I'm um, just, again, my sincere thanks um, to Gabby and Alicia for including me in this um, class. I'm really excited um, to talk to you all a little bit about this project. Um, it's certainly um, one of my favorite projects I've done so far. Um, and so I hope that you'll hear some of that enthusiasm um, throughout the presentation today. Um, I also want to thank my current research supervisors, um, as well as all the people who contributed to this project. And I have a special slide for that at the end. Um, it truly was the work of a lot of different people. Um, so before we begin, um, I would like to just briefly talk about um, what we'll talk about today. Um, so the content of today's presentation, first we'll talk about just the general motivation, like the research aims that I had when I um, began this project. Um, we're going to skip for today photogrammetric modeling as archaeological illustration, um, but there is a, a publication um, which if you want to learn more about that, you can go read about that. Um, but I will talk about the project background and the, the methods and the materials because I I know that's very interesting um, to those of you taking the class who want to learn how to do photogrammetry, which we'll be doing soon at the end of this um, presentation, and then the case study results and my conclusions um, from the research project. So I'll probably have the same issue with the video playing. Yeah. Okay, so here you can see a video of the photogrammetric model of room 16 in the house of Marcus Lucretius in Pompeii. Um, these structures face danger of both damage and destruction post excavation, as I'm sure you're all aware. And while efforts are underway to preserve the material that has come down to us today, finds begin to deteriorate from the moment they're exposed to the air. Photogrammetry has begun to be used for documentation preservation, and as a first stage in the reconstruction of archaeological sites, which I'll talk more about in a moment. But photogrammetry is also well suited to aiding in the analysis and interpretation of Roman domestic art and architecture, as I will present today. So this presentation will discuss the results of several photogrammetric campaigns undertaken in the house of Marcus Lucretius. In the process, I'll explore both the combination of perception studies with digital modeling and the use of photogrammetric models in particular to represent and explore complex relationships in space. It should be noted that mine and ours is certainly not the first project to be undertaken on the house. On the left, you see a 3D restoration model recently produced by the Pompeii Project at the University of Helsinki, um, which is an incredible project, and I encourage you all to, to go explore um, that work. Another project was recently undertaken by Summer Trenton and has recently sought to create a SketchUp model of the site. Apologies, I don't have permission to share images of that project, but similarly, please um, go research it. It's a fascinating article. So while models offer a scholar the opportunity to recreate missing elements and think through possible displays in antiquity, it's also possible to even use basic photogrammetric models as a way of exploring relationships between the viewer and the space and experiment with a variety of possible arrangements for art and architecture within. So our project attempted to do just that. And it's worth noting again, however, that ours is certainly not the first. There have been other projects and excellent ones at that which have sought to overlay hypothetical reconstructions on top of either laser scans or photogrammetric models. So here you can see the, high up, the house of Kaili Secundus, um, a project undertaken um, to reconstruct but also just document 
the state of preservation in the house at Pompeii. And this software then allows the user to toggle quickly from one model to another, thereby facilitating a kind of quick visual comparison between the reconstruction model and the extant material record. Um, so for example, this project included both in their visualization and as will be presented um, later in this class, this is possible using 3D GIS or other geographic information systems. A bit closer to home, so to speak, uh, members of King's College London and the Visualization Lab, as well as in project with the Aplantis, um, in conjunction with the Aplantis project, created a model of Villa A, or the Villa of Papea in Unity 3D. And this visualization allowed a viewer to simply press the R key on their keyboard and toggle between the current and restored state of the villa on their desktop computer. So these types of models are useful in a variety of ways um, for studies concerned with viewing, interpretation, and perception. And so I'd like to present several specific concrete ways um, that these can be used in projects such as mine. Um, so it's generally assumed that aspects of social significance um, within Roman domestic space are embedded within the house and that it's possible to more fully understand Roman daily life through the careful observation of these features. And so the use of analysis tools such as photogrammetric models allow a researcher not only to digitally consider a space at many different points in time, but also simply organize symbolic information that has been observed on site. Um, models also allow a researcher to question both the modern reconstruction, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, as well as other versions of reconstruction, both physical and digital. And so briefly, I'll now present um, just sort of my methods. Um, so while we've mostly talked thus far about photogrammetry and research, it's perhaps most useful for this session and the class as a whole to describe some of the practical steps in just digitally modeling a Roman house. As with any research project, the methods and instruments used for data capture depend on the model's intended application, as Alicia already mentioned. And so for the purposes of this case study, we wanted to create a high resolution photogrammetric model with the primary goal to facilitate a deeper understanding of the space and explore interactions throughout the house. This type of modeling provided the following benefits to our project. So it's possible for a single person to capture and process the model components at a relatively low cost. The results were photorealistic and useful for interpretation and analysis. And again, I'll talk more about this in a moment. And the state model or just photogrammetric model was also a great starting point for further reconstruction. So we actually were able to use the photogrammetric model as a space to build off of a reconstruction model so that we could ensure, again, with that quick back and forth, that the, um, the model, the, the reconstruction model, thinking about the way that something might have been um, built in the past is actually you know, founded in what we're seeing on the ground, so to speak, at the archeological site. In addition, it was possible to embed missing materials such as wall paintings that had been removed to a nearby archeological museum or a deposito. So to create a photogrammetric state model of an architectural space, the first step is a thorough photographic campaign. For the case study described here, our team used a Nikon D850 with a 28 millimeter lens, which was well suited to low lighting conditions within the house. Um, we developed a single process for photographing a room, which I'll present in a moment. And then the same process was used for each room and then multiplied many times over. One of the keys of photogrammetric modeling, um, as Alicia will discuss and has discussed, uh, is that it's generally aimed at overlapping between shots. And so in general, for each photograph, we um, tried to overlap at least 40% between each photo. And then an architectural space complicates the general single item approach to photogrammetry a bit because rather than envisioning sort of a sphere around the individual object, um, you have to capture every inch of the room. And so a useful way that I try to think about this is to simply reverse the shapes. So if you imagine yourself in a, cent in a center sphere in the middle of the room and then sort of look outward from that sphere, every element um, of the room, of the ceiling, of the floor is something that needs to be photographed and sort of included in your model. Um, so briefly, uh, scaling is also very important for this type of project, especially when dealing with such a large 
space. Um, so for each room, a set of laminated targets were set down in each corner of the room, as well as at midpoints for the larger rooms. And the distance between each target was measured, giving our model a relative scale. Um, a tripod was also useful, especially on the uneven mosaic flooring. Um, and then a monopod was useful um, to photograph some of the higher areas of walls and ceilings. Um, as you can imagine, if you were trying to photograph um, a high ceiling cathedral or something like that, sometimes it's necessary to have a monopod to capture um, some of the geometry that's beyond your reach. So here's an outline of kind of how we moved around an individual space. Um, so for each room, the camera and tripod were first placed in the center of the room and three rounds of photos were captured. One aimed at the lower portion of the walls, one at the center, and then one at the upper regions using the monopod. And this floor plan shows the process um, generally overtaken. So starting at those purple arrows in the middle and then moving out um, to the blue and to the pink and eventually um, the orange. Um, and depending on the width and height of the room, the tripod and monopod were alternated as needed. Um, we used the same camera, um, so we simply mounted the camera on the monopod and the tripod kind of alternating as needed. And then after these rounds were complete, the camera was positioned closer to the wall to capture areas of detail, such as especially flaking pigments or details in the wall painting that we found particularly interesting. Um, for the high resolution model, just, just to give you an idea of each room, um, for smaller rooms, it was generally necessary, such as if you look at um, room six or room seven, about 600 to 900 photos for those rooms. And then for the larger rooms like the atrium, sometimes as many as 2000 photos. Um, so once each photographic campaign was complete, the photos were then edited for consistent exposure. Um, we used Adobe Lightroom, but any, any software um, that can do mass editing can be equally useful. And then during this process, it was also critical to take a number of photos at transition points, um, such as doorways, where tie points between individual 3D models were more likely to be created. So while we did each room as sort of its own photographic campaign, we did eventually want to stitch together a model of the entire house. And so using those tie points between doorways and windows is a really useful way to create those connections between individual models. And then once the photos were complete, Post-processing was actually relatively quick um, for this project and um, once we had exposed correctly all the photos um, automatically. And we used Reality Capture to stitch our photos together, but as we'll talk about in a moment, Adisoft, Adisoft Metashape would work equally well. Um, and then we just edited the draft to prepare the final version and delivered copies of the photos and 3D models to the Sopra and Tendenza, uh, and then finally uploaded to Sketchfab, uh, which is, as Alicia mentioned, a, an online hosting uh, service for models. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ways that photogrammetry in these houses, but in the house of Marcus Lucretius specifically can be difficult. Um, so first of all, imagine some of these rooms are no more than maybe six by six feet. Um, so it's quite small, um, dark rooms too, because some of the light is often only provided by high windows, such as the image you see on the left. Um, so for these rooms, especially that um, really powerful lens and camera that can uh, illuminate low light well, were super important. Um, I'm not sure we would be able to do some of these um, rooms without the use of that high quality camera. Um, another kind of uh, problem that we faced, especially in the house of Marcus Lucretius, because the center of the house, if I go back, this slide. So all of um, room two, indeed all of room 15 and all of room 18, as well as these back rooms are all open to the um, to the sky. And so depending on how much light is coming into the house at any given moment, you can get these really blown out shots. Um, so in this photo, you see um, kind of this back lighting. And this is actually a screenshot of the 3D model itself. So unfortunately, that light is just baked into the model because um, you know, the, the light was so bright. Now, in an ideal world, we would have always been operating in diffuse lighting conditions, but because the house is also open to the public, we sort of had to work whenever we could get into the house when there weren't a lot of people there. Um, so, you know, this in an ideal world, we would have only worked on, on low light and kind of diffuse light days, but unfortunately, um, you know, nature of field work, we had to sort of work when we could. And the last kind of um, interesting challenge we faced, and this wasn't necessarily so much in the house of Marcus Lucretius, but um, another project that um, I had the privilege of working on um, sort of dealt with reflective 
panels. And so um, an example of one of these is um, on the back of the wall in the middle of the mysteries. You can sort of see this really bright spot from the light that's coming in through the window. And this is um, this was a, probably the most difficult challenge um, that I faced uh, in my photogra photographic work at Pompeii was just these, um, some of these wall paintings are so restored that they're actually incredibly reflective themselves. And so you've got the camera trying to capture an area which is just blown out in white. And so the way that we solved this was to sort of move strategically um, as needed. Um, so if if the wall was very blown out, we would sort of just shift the camera to the left or the right in very slow phases until we found that ideal angle to capture that part of the painting that we were looking for. And then just did that over the series of, of the panels until finally we were able to, to stitch together uh, good models and good photos. Um, so to conclude, I'd like to just briefly go back to the ways that the model were useful in my research, because I'm sure a lot of you are thinking about research questions you'd like to use photogrammetric models on. Um, so first, just for me personally, creating a 3D model and digitally reinserting, reinserting the material was a great way to sort of think through how these objects are interacting in space. So on this slide, you see there are three different wall paintings. Um, one is still in situ, so the one in purple is, is still in the house, but the ones that are in blue and pink have actually been removed. And so it's, it's hard to get a sense of this, right? I mean, you can do this kind of mapping that I've done here on the slide, but to really imagine how the figures in the paintings might have um, interacted with the viewer in the space, I found it incredibly helpful to embed these panels um, in the 3D model that we created and then think about how it interacted with the central garden because the green arrows here indicate a window. And so actually I found that as you walked into room 16 with these paintings, your eye sort of followed. So first you would have seen two here at the back. And so you'll see his eyes are kind of looking off to his right directly into the garden, which is quite interesting. And then this figure in panel three, actually his eyes are turned towards you as you enter the room. And so there's this interesting interplay of gazes sort of also directing your eye out to the garden, um, which would have been particularly interesting um, in the evening. You know, the Romans had these fantastic dining parties. And so you would have actually maybe seen with firelight illuminating the central garden, something really quite fantastic in that space. Um, and so it's interesting that the wall paintings are kind of then also directing your, your gaze out through the window. Um, so in any case, I, I found that a really useful tool um, for thinking through things. And then also um, just comparing sources and documentation. So this actually came up um, the last time that I gave um, this presentation and it was, it was great feedback. And so we actually used the 3D model to sort of compare sources and documentation. Um, so the garden has evolved over time. So in the illustration you see on the left, um, this was one of the first engravings to be taken of the house. And you can see some, some ancient tourists here looking into the garden, um, really quite lovely. Um, and so yeah, some of these sculptures, if then you look at this photograph, um, which is from the Air Archive, um, a bit later, and now we've got a new sculpture that's just suddenly appeared in the arrangement. Um, and then if you even compare to the modern on-site reconstruction that's displayed, if you, if you visit the site, you, there are more ways that they vary. And so the 3D model was actually a great tool for sort of noting these differences between sources and then saying, oh, well, why did this move? Um, was this actually originally from the space? And sort of questioning that. Um, and then lastly, um, again, just some few concrete ways that this was useful for interpretation and analysis. So especially relevant during COVID-19, it allowed us to just digitally revisit the space as needed um, to recontextualize paintings, as I already mentioned, to digitally notate which paintings were located on which wall and then consider how they interacted, um, to experiment with different view sheds into the central garden, which was the subject of, of my paper, um, and then just also comparing um, sources and documentation. And I'm sure you um, and we and everyone here um, will continue discovering more ways um, that these can be so useful uh, in research and, and interpretation. So just to conclude, um, there were so many people that contributed to this project and I'm incredibly grateful. And then again, just thanks um, to Gabby and to Alicia um, for including me in today's activities. Great, thank you. Um, that's really useful. Um, I've already have questions, but I think I'll wait until the end um, for um, 
for for some of that. A reminder to anybody watching live um, that you can ask questions in the in the live chat feature um, to the right of the video on YouTube, and we'll um, we'll have a look at them at the end. Um, but I think because we're um, we're a little bit behind schedule, not because anybody's overrun, but because we started a bit late, um, we should we should go straight to the um, to the tutorial. So I think um, to Alicia first. Yeah, um, if I can bring my PowerPoint back up. Yes, perfect. And okay, yeah. So for this tutorial, um, we're Kelly and I are going to split up um, what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to go over image capturing and very briefly just give you um, some equipment that you're going to need and some best practice and tips um, that will help you. So first, obviously, you're going to need a good camera with a high resolution. Um, Agisoft Metashape recommends five megapixels or more. Uh, many people do have success with their smartphones even. Um, so yeah, um, you can you know, try out different things. Um, Agisoft also has a long list online of their recommendations for um, camera's focal length and aperture and shutter speed and stuff like that. So it's worth checking out um, if you are interested and you want to make some really high quality photos. Um, just make sure that the camera is in focus when you're taking the photos. Um, but of course, you can erase blurry photos um, before you begin processing. Then you are going to need good lighting. Um, the object should be evenly lit. Um, so avoid using a light source that's going to create long shadows. Um, and remove any light sources from the camera's field of view. And these are all pretty easy to achieve if you're uh, working inside. Um, outside can be a little bit trickier, so try to do it when the sun isn't creating long shadows or even better on a cloudy day. And uh, when you're taking the photos, you can either place the object on a turntable or you can place it on a flat surface and with the ability for you to move with the camera um, 360 degrees around it. Um, many people like using the turntable uh, approach. I personally like moving around the object um, just because I find that having different backgrounds helps the software find different reference points. Um, but again, teach your own. And if you're going to use a turntable, um, it helps to have a blank background. Um, so either a black or a white one, depending on the color of your object. Um, and like Kelly mentioned in her presentation, um, if you want to have accurate measurements of the 3D data and be able to scale them in the software, you can use scale bars. Um, and again, there are some guidelines on edgesoft.com um, for placing these correctly. And then markers can also be used um, by placing them around the object to add uh, extra reference points, uh, both for scale and to help the software align the photos correctly. And while you're taking the photos, it's important to have enough overlap. Um, so each part of the object should be in at least two different photographs. Um, I like to do between 50 and 60% overlap. Um, some people suggest 40 to 50%, but 50% is kind of the sweet spot. And it's ideal to keep the camera at the same distance as you go around. Um, but in some cases, you may want to do a close up, which is fine. Um, as long as you're moving the camera without changing the focal length of the camera, um, because this causes confusion for the software. Mm -hmm. And make sure that the object is in a stable position. So you should not move the object while you're taking photos. And if you accidentally move it, then unfortunately, unfortunately you will have to start over. Um, ideally, you want to take your photos and process them immediately um, so that when you're processing them and you find that you missed a spot or something's blurry, then you can go back to the object which has not been moved and you can just take a couple of photos. Um, but this isn't always possible. So um, like say if you're taking something, shooting something outside and then you go inside and or process it another day, then um, you may have to start all over again. And um, it happens, and it may probably happen the first time. Um, so just be patient and keep with it, and you will get better over time. 
And um, then I want to just show you some, if I can go back to the view of me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so just to show you really quickly, um, just how you would take the photos. So say I wanted to take, make a 3D model of this 3D printed stone baboon that Gabby and I printed together um, in London. Um, so if I wanted to make a new 3D model um, of this, some people like to just take photos any which way, um, go crazy, which is fine if that works, but I like to be a bit more systematic so that I know that I'm capturing um, everything. So first I would, um, if say my hand was the camera, I would just go straight on and go all the way around 360 degrees and then do it from an angle, another round. And then if it's possible with your camera, um, try to angle upwards so that you're catching all of the um, undersides. And then don't forget to get the top of it. Um, and this has a flat base, so um, I would probably just leave it like that and let the software um, autofill it. But if you wanted, if you say had another item that you wanted to get the underside of, you would first um, shoot it as I just explained. And then there is an option to um, flip the object over and take a separate round of photos. And then in Agisoft, there's an option to merge two different chunks of photos. And we've attached a very nice uh, YouTube tutorial um, on our webpage um, on how to do this. So uh, if you're interested. And I think that's all I have. Um, actually, this item I also wanted to show you because this may be an example of something that would not work very well because it is quite shiny. Um, so some untextured, reflective, or transparent objects are not going to um, be captured very well. So it's something to keep in mind when you're choosing your item to model. Um, OK, and then I'll pass it on to Kelly. OK, um, so I'm just actually going to play a video of how to do the processing in Agisoft because the models take so long um, to process. Um, but I just a couple notes before I play the video. Um, I will talk in the video about a software used um, to edit models, which is called ZBrush. Is it necessary to use this? And I think um, you guys will be using something else in a few weeks. So just a quick caveat on that. Um, and then also just a note that um, I think I talked specifically about processing models on high. But if you have a low GPU computer or graphics processing unit, or maybe just if you have a little bit of an older computer, it's better to use settings low and medium. And your model will still turn out great. Um, and you won't give your computer a, a nightmare. So um, yeah, I would highly recommend doing that when you guys get to that point. So I will now share the video. Um, Gabby, I guess with the with the sharing issue, maybe could you play the video actually? Sorry, I wasn't prepared. I'm not sure if I have it handy. Um, do, you, do you want to go ahead and try? And if it doesn't work, I'll, I'll hopefully have found it. I did. Yeah, unfortunately, I did try, and it's not, okay. it's not working. But um, I can resend it to email just real quick. Um, Sorry, guys, for this. No, got it, got it. I'll just need to download it again from your okay. email. It's quite short, so everybody be relieved. <laughs> it's yeah. not very yeah. long. so. Okay, let me just uh, see if I can share that. Okay, great. So now that we've gone through the photography process, I'm going to go through an overview of how to process your data in Metashape. Um, so the first thing you want to do is to select your images. 
So you'll see as soon as we come into MetaShape, um, there are uh, just the normal kind of Windows uh, options on the top left. So file, edit, view, workflow, uh, model, photo, tools, and help. We're going to spend most of our time in file and in workflow. Um, I would encourage you, as when learning any new software, to check out those other tabs um, and figure out what they do. Um, but for today, we're just going to do a step-by-step -step process. Um, so if you go to Workflow and Add Photos, if you find the folder on your computer where your photos are located, um, and if they're not in a normal file format, you will have to convert them. Um, so for instance, I know iPhones um, create like a proprietary formatted image. Um, you will need to convert those to either JPEGs or PNGs. Um, you can just Google how to do that. I think there's a free converter available that we used in the spring semester. It's quite easy. Um, so well, once your photos are in a normal format, go ahead and add photos. And then we're going to align the photos. Um, so you'll see in the bottom uh, panel, when your photos are there, you'll see you know, them pop up. Um, you can scroll through them if you want, be sure they're all there. Um, and when you're ready, just click Align Photos. In your Options panel, um, you'll see a couple different things. So accuracy, I think by default, is set to high. That's perfectly fine. Um, and all the rest of the settings you can leave to default as well. Um, if we're working on much more complicated models, we might need to edit these um, in more detail, but for now we can just leave them to the default settings. Once the first part of our model um, is, you know, sort of processing, I would recommend going away, getting a cup of coffee. Um, this can take a while depending on how, uh, you know, fast your computer is. Um, but once it's done, this Um, some things to look at here, um, Metashape gives us this nice um, blue kind of preview of where each photo was taken. Um, this can be really useful to see how well your coverage, you know, was done even before we get to looking at the actual mesh. Um, so I would spend some time here just kind of rotating around and seeing how, um, how your coverage looks. If there's an area you need to go back and re-photograph, um, you can do that now and then add those photos, assuming that, um, object is still in the same place. If you've moved it, um, you're going to have to re-photograph it to add those photos. Uh, and then we're going to start to adjust things. So the first thing we can adjust is the bounding box. Um, so if you click on this little icon with the box in the hand and then click and drag left and right, you can see that you can adjust your bounding box. Um, be careful though not to crop out um, any parts of the object that you actually want to model. Um, but this is a really nice way to go ahead and delete some of the data we don't need. Um, so like for this portrait, when it came in, it had this whole room. Um, so I adjusted the bounding box down to really just focus on the portrait itself. Um, the other thing we can do is to adjust the orientation. Um, so this uh, kind of ball in the middle of the model has um, three axes, so green, um, being the horizontal, red being the vertical, and blue being the z-axis, or, you know, complete rotation of the object. Go ahead and play with those um, and just see what that does. This can be useful if maybe you photographed an object in a strange position, such as upside down, and then you want to bring it back um, to right side up in your final results. Um, you can just do a rotation here uh, in Medishape. And then we're going to go ahead and progress on to the next step. So if you go to Workflow and Build Mesh, um, that's actually going to generate, right, like we talked about, um, the second step of the 3D modeling process, which is uh, an object that has vertices, an object that is linked um, into a plane. And what we're going to get is something like this. Um, so as you can see, because I didn't uh, adjust my bounding box the first time, I'm seeing the entire room in which the object is located. Um, so if I wanted to go back and do this again, I would maybe adjust that bounding box down a little bit. But ultimately, we can edit this out in ZBrush. It just saves you time if you have your bounding box set properly from the get-go. So go ahead and spend some time um, inspecting it, right? Um, how does the mesh look? Um, to see the actual portrait here, we would have to zoom in past the blue boxes or toggle those off, um, which you can do by going to cameras and um, the little camera here and turning that off. 
Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and build the texture. So again, in workflow, go ahead and click build texture. And that will take some more time to run. And then finally, we are ready to export for editing in ZBrush. So to export, just go to file, export, export model. Okay. And then uh, just a couple, just a couple additional notes. Um, so when I was going through that whole process, um, first of all, I'll share those slides. So if you found it difficult to sort of zoom in and see those settings, I'll share the slide deck and also the video so that you can review that afterwards. But just to mention, there's also a fantastic tutorial on the Agisoft website as well, which sort of takes you through screen by screen. Um, and as you saw, most things are on that single menu tab um, to just go through the workflow. So they've made it very easy to sort of start processing your first 3D models, which I'm sure we'll all look forward to seeing later this, this semester. Great, thank you. Thank you both, that's um, that's really cool. Yeah, I think the um, the point about the, um, the the resolution and the quality settings in, um, in Metashape um, it really does depend on the on the machine. I've found um, unless I'm using a specifically um, high powered machine designed for um, 3D processing, um, that it's much better to use medium or or sometimes even low quality on um, on some of those settings. But um, <clears throat> it's uh, uh, even even a fairly good laptop that's not that's not you know a, a specifically gaming or 3D um, device and can struggle um, with some of the steps in particular. So, um, so try it on high-ish quality, uh, maybe the second highest quality first time. And if it says this is going to take 92 hours, then stop and start again on a you know on a lower quality, which is um, um, just to see yeah see how it works. Some steps will 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 go fairly quickly. It might take five or ten minutes, but but even at high quality, but some steps will you know 96 hours was not an exaggeration. Um, um, so it also depends how many photographs and how big your photographs are. So if you've got very high resolution photographs, um, or if you've got a hundred photographs or more, then it'll it'll be very very slow to to, to do the rendering in um, in MetaShape. Uh, but, but if you have um, you know a smallish number of, um, of photographs, if you so. 20 to 40 photographs, you should still be able to get a 3D model if it's not too complex an object. Um, obviously, the more photographs, the better. But for this experiment, you know, you might be fine with a smaller number. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll have to experiment. Um, I, I fully expect that everybody will have to try it at least three times to get um, to get a, a model that they're happy with at the end. So, so do be prepared to, to give it a few a few attempts and don't be don't be discouraged if it doesn't if it doesn't work immediately. Um, Likewise, for the photography, you'll you know you'll try various different methods, and you'll realize you've missed a spot. Despite you know everything that Alicia said, you know you'll 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 miss the under the chin or something like that. You know, um, cool. Um, okay, so um, a reminder: um, please do, if you're watching live, please um, feel free to ask questions on the. Um, on the live chat, there there are a couple of questions there already, which we'll look at at a moment. Um, I wanted to ask um, a question um, to both um, Kelly and Alicia um, about your respective projects. Um, it, it's sort of two questions, but they're they're, they're very closely related. Um, the first part is, um, could you could you say something about to what degree the the interpretations that you're making of your objects, of your buildings, of your subject? Um, as you do your research, as you decide what to image and how to image it, um, are becoming embedded in these models, which can look um, like they're they're very objective. You know, people say the camera doesn't lie. I mean, we know the camera does lie. We know three D models lie too. So, to what degree your interpretation is becoming embedded and that is impacting on the results you're getting from this? Um, and so, the related question is. Um, some of these some of these models are absolutely beautiful. They're, they're so high resolution. They have you know these very very good um, you know photographic surfaces um, attached to them, textures and so forth. Um, do you ever get to the point where you think this is too good? It's too realistic. The quality is too high, and that causes problems in that it's potentially misleading or or other 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 kinds of issues that might that might arise from that. If either of you wanted to make any comments on that that area of um, things. Um, yeah, well, in terms of interpretation, I, for the
for the project I mentioned, I kind of had to train myself to think differently for each material type. Um, so like I mentioned, the, the reasoning for creating 3D models of all of them were different. So I had to think, okay, like one, it's really important that I have a, a good texture, whereas another one, it's not important, um, but I need a good mesh. So it really, um, yeah, determined how I went about it and again, determined the software that I used. Um, and your second question, um, I would like to say that that has happened. <laughs> no, <laughs> um, especially when you're first starting out, like, uh, I mean, I've been doing it for a few years, but you still, you're still always gonna come up with difficulties. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess it depends on what the use of it is going to be ultimately, but um yeah, I think as long as you come up with something that you are happy with overall and yeah. Um, but yeah, I can't say that that has happened to me yet, but that's something to strive for, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would just, yeah, add, I think like, because my project was specifically, I was wanting to interpret the material, I think that certainly played a part in every stage in the project. And when we published the material, you know, we stated that clearly saying the goal was to do this type of model. And so I think it would be a very different thing if our goal had been documentation and yet we then started using. So I think it's good to have your goals for the project very clearly defined at the beginning and then sort of every step think about, am I actually using the model in the way that I stated I would, if not, how, how could I change that or what do I need to be noting about that? So yes, definitely incredibly important. Um, and I agree with Alicia, maybe one day, but not yet. So I think you, you've, you um, part, part, of, part of your answer, I think answers the, the next thing I was gonna ask, which is how can you mitigate problems with potentially misleading people with with these things? And and you, you mentioned documentation, you mentioned, you mentioned describing your your um your methodology and so forth very clearly and making sure you stick to it or you you document any changes to it um yeah i guess it's um important to be transparent in your um in your process and always attach your uh metadata and your paradata w whenever you're publishing um anything anywhere so yeah um so um questions from the um from the audience the main question um, that i see so far is a question about um, differences between some of the different imaging software um that are available would um would somebody is that something that somebody feels able to to i mean either either in the specific as in software x has these advantages or or just in in maybe in, in the more general what what factors go into your um, making um, decisions about what software you're going to use? Yeah, I can take and then hand off to Alicia. I think one of the ones primarily for us is financial. So Reality Capture is quite a bit more expensive than Agisoft. Um, and I know that there are some advantages, though, if you wanted to do a project where you're realizing aligning laser scan data with photogrammetric data. Reality Capture can do that. I don't think Agisoft, have they done that yet? Can you now align laser scan data with photogrammetric data? I don't think so. If they have, it's a recent update and apologies, I'm not aware of it. So the advantage of if you had, for instance, a um, like I showed that point cloud of the house of Marcus Lucretius, it would have been incredible to be able to do a laser scan and then have the photogrammetric data and compare exactly where they were accurate, exactly how you know each scan was differing. And I think you can align your photogrammetry data to the laser scan. So if the laser scan is more accurate, you can snap your photogrammetric data to that and suddenly your whole model becomes a lot more accurate. So we definitely want to do that in the future with that project, but we have not pursued that yet just due to financial constraints on the project. Like yeah, um, I've used Agisoft almost exclusively, and um, yeah, it just has to do with what's available. Um, if your university has a license um, for something, and my university had it for Agisoft, and um, I think it's a really great program, and there's lots of tutorials online of um, how to work with it. Um, but there are 
are uh, free softwares that you can use, such as um, Meshroom is one, and we have links uh, tutorial for that one too. So um, yeah, there are lots of options out there and depending on your budget. So budget is the the main the main thing that's come up um, for for all of these. the The functionality is largely, I mean, all of these allow you to manipulate models. All of these allow you to generate the the three D data into a into a a point cloud and a mesh. Yeah, I think all of them have all the same workflow, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Obviously, some will be more specialized than others, and yeah. yeah. And some, I think, you may have a limit on how many photos you can upload. Um, so that would, um, yeah, determine which one you want to use. So. Yeah. And some will have um, uh, technical requirements on the machine you're using. Some mm -hmm. some will work on all platforms. Um, some some don't. Um, I think we we found at least one very good free. Um, tool that doesn't work on Windows, for example, that that was um, that was awkward. I forget which one that was, but we we, we decided not to use it for that reason. Um, but um, um, there's also a difference in how the licensing structured. So for Reality Capture, I think you can get a three month demo, but then you have to purchase the entire software. Versus Agisoft, which is ex again extremely expensive. Agisoft, I think you purchase it right and you have it for its entirety. So there, there were some, so we used reality capture a little bit, but then discovered, oh, wait, we have to purchase the whole license so we can't use it sustainably throughout. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I guess anybody doing this sort of work would have to look at their budget and and do some research into what's it. Also, we could give, we could give advice on this, but anyone watching this video in six months, it may not be may not be valid anymore because new tools will have appeared, new functionality will have appeared, pricing might have changed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, did either of you have any questions for each other before we before we end or anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I didn't have any questions for Kelly, but I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. And I thought it was um, really interesting. And I really liked the um, part about embedding the um, the wall paintings into the 3D model, just to add that extra uh, interactivity. And um, how you had to deal with um, people coming into the room too while <laughs> you're working on it, like the nature of field work. <laughs> so, yeah, so just, yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, no, I was really fascinated by your project as well. I was going to ask you, since you worked with so many different types of materials, and you just talked about this, you know, a minute ago, that it it sort of was a different thinking process each time. So I was wondering if you would feel comfortable just kind of sharing how you had to change your thinking for dealing with the ceramic versus working with a bone fragment for the photogrammetry, but then also maybe just in general, how you're thinking differently about each material set. Yeah, well, I mean, it had largely to do with what the um, project managers wanted out of it. So um, it just was a lot of discussing with them. Um, and yeah, it had to do with the equipment too, because I mean, I tried to do uh, work with lithics on, using photogrammetry and laser scanning. And usually it wouldn't work because like they were quite small and the edges were just so thin that uh, it just wouldn't capture it at all. So um, yeah, it was just a lot of a lot of discussing, a lot of trial and error um, until you, you found, I finally got the the right thing that worked. So, yeah, just a lot of playing around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <It's> <laughs> comparative process to work with so many different types of material in a, such a small space in three months, you know, to kind of think about each one. So that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah I, I enjoyed doing it. It was. Um, interesting to like um yeah get to prepare compare all of these different techniques and then um get to handle different uh, material too which maybe i normally wouldn't get to in um like smaller projects so. great yes no thank you thank you both very much um indeed for this and the that that thanks is being echoed by several people in the chat mm -hmm. um um saying saying they found this very useful and very helpful um, I think we, we probably have run out of time. Um, 
the um, uh, so if you're following this session specifically for the 3D content, the next 3D um, specific session in this um, in this semester is on March 4th, um, which is on various aspects of publishing and sharing 3D models with some discussion of, um, of intellectual property, um, where we'll be joined by Tom Flynn um, from Sketchfab and Binu Shemendis from the University of um, Bournemouth. Um, there are other sessions um, as well that, that will be um, of, of interest. The, the GIS session, for example, will be a, of interest if you're interested in 3D landscapes and so forth. Um, but the next session in the Digital Cultural Heritage module as a whole is next week on uh, January 28th, and we'll be joined um, by James Morley from the, um, the creator of the A Street Near You app and uh, Valeria Vitale from the, um, the Locating a National Collection project at the British Library, um, who will talk to us about community mapping. Um, so please do join us for that um, if you can. Um, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Gabby, for um, hosting and for giving us the overview in, of 3D imaging in the beginning. And yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining. Yeah, thank you again. Cheers. <laughs>